Hello there, everyone. It's a Gallagher Shots YouTube channel. It's we haven't got a title for this one. We've normally got some sort of snappy um, podcast title, but we haven't done that for this one. It's Bestie and Decker's Book Club, shall we call it something like that? Decker. That sounds good. That sounds that, good. Mate. I like that. Like, I like, like that. kind of like the the, the South Tyneside Oprah Winfrey type of thing, or Richard <laughs> and Judy. Yeah. But we're here. It's a bit of a special one. We're joined by uh, Harry De Um Harry, how are you doing, mate? You all right. I'm good, thanks. Cheers, Bessie. How are you? How are you I'm not too bad, thanks. I've um, in in quite uh, mundane news, uh, quite a blister on me heel on Monday, going for a walk. Like so, I'm uh, I'm kind of torn between wanting to go out for walks and lose weight and make the most, and kind of not wanting to upset that. And it's also made us think maybe I don't know how to wear shoes properly. <laughs> like I've been wearing, I'm 39 now, and I, I, I'm surely I'm not doing anything wrong, but I don't know. Maybe I am. Like, but uh, yeah, Deck, how are you, mate? You all right. I'm very good, thank you, Russ. I'm <clears throat> looking forward to tonight. Um, really good subject. Um, speaking about the man, one of our, one of our all-time favourites. Um, so yeah. yeah, I've got no blisters, so that's always good as well. I've got no blisters on my feet, so that's always good. But yes, I'm very much looking forward to it. On your hands at all, like that? Oh, I always on my hands. I play the guitar, so I'm always struggling <laughs> with the hands. Like, <laughs> um, so Harry, um, we're going to come to you now. Um, obviously, the book you've written, um, Black and White Night, How to Bobby Robson Made Me Cast United Again. Um, come so very soon. What was it that I write a book about Bobby? Uh, well, I, I wanted to do it because it was, I mean, it was a brilliant experience. I wanted to do it basically because, um, I think there's two reasons why I wanted to do it. One is a sort of personal thing, is that I always wanted to write a book and, and I, I care so much, but also, and there's a story to be told about you know how how he it's called how he made Newcastle United again because it, he. You know, it it shows what he what he did and what the club is struggling to do now in terms of connecting to the city and the community and 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 there was a whole a big that buzz that stereotypical thing and the the cliche thing that everyone says about Newcastle was like was really alive at that time I think but also I think because um, it was it was key to do it because I think that people don't quite realise how good of a job Bobby did at Newcastle I think when you look at the um, the documentaries and the everything that's been pretty much written or or shown about Bobby's career and when people talk about Bobby's career they talk more about Ipswich and England and Barcelona and then Newcastle's kind of an afterthought where it's like oh yeah he went home for five years and did and managed Newcastle's boyhood club and then he retired or then you know he cancer took its hold or whatever and it's like I think people need to realize how much of a cultural impact he made and why he was such a good Manager for Newcastle, how how underrated in a way his job is is in the wider in the wider sense. It, his time at Newcastle deserves more focus. I think is is basically why I ended up doing the book. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, when you look at kind of, I mean, there've been some pretty big films made about him over the past mm -hmm. um, ten years or so, mm -hmm. and I suppose it's understandable. I mean, the outsider maybe is a bit of a footnote in his career. You know, I mean, yeah. Foley was here for nearly five years. Um, you look at what he did with Ipswich Town, with wait every club he was at, Barcelona, Lisbon, PSV. Um, he was a with England even. Um, although he, he did get a, a pretty hard time as England manager um, until the very end. Um, he, he, he won things. He kind of and, and people loved him, didn't they? Yeah, and that that's kind of the point. I think that in the end, I did a chapter on his foundation. And I did a chapter about him personally as well and a little bit about his background and the things that come through in those in both those chapters and droves is just how much of a brilliant person he was and how everybody and that almost also reflected in my the way I managed to get people involved the people I got involved to to speak to me was because they were so desperate to speak about Bobby and speak about that time and and you know maybe put some records straight on certain things which I'm sure we'll get into later but generally I think people were just so excited and so happy to talk about Bobby because that time working with him was was such a highlight for their in their careers. Everybody loved him. I do think also sort of linking to the first question. I think that you asked me, um, he didn't get the love that he deserved throughout his career. If you look at his last fifteen years, I mean, he was trodden on badly by England, spat out by Barcelona, and then spat out again by Newcastle. Um, and the introduction of the book goes into why he was spat out by how he was spat out by Barcelona when. Newcastle tried to get him to replace Kevin Keegan. I also didn't, I don't remember the Keegan years as well, which is kind of why, I, going back to the first question, why another reason why, I don't remember the Keegan years. I was born in 94. I'm part of a generation that only, that, that started supporting Newcastle around Sir Bobby 
So Bobby's era, my dad told me all the stories and I, I grew up watching the videos, knowing the stories of the Keegan years, but I don't physically remember them. Whereas the Bobby years, that's my, that's where I started to remember things and started going to games. And I was at the, you know, most of the, most of the big ones I, I, I think, and I can remember and just generally being there. But that enthusiasm and how much everyone loved him was reflected in the team and that buzz around the city, I think. I, I think it was um, huge. I, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, go ahead, sorry, mate. Um, you you really correct there in what you're saying regards to everyone remembers the Keegan here. I don't know so well, and yeah. it's something that I think it's talked about from every inch of a column is always about the entertaining entertainers years in the ninety five yeah. ninety six. And I really think the Robson era kind of gets forgotten about of just how amazing that era was. Um, and you, as what you're saying, the reason why you've written the book is is a, is a fantastic reason. Um, mm. Obviously, you've mentioned there about you know, getting people on board to be able to, you know, to come on and, 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 and question them and stuff like that. Um, what, what What's like the process of that in terms of when you, obviously you're going to start writing the book, obviously, um, you've got your plan. How do you go into the idea, right, what players am I going to choose? How do I get in contact with them? How does that work? It's literally, it is sort of like, it's not, as, there's not this big sort of idea that I had. I mean, I did have roughly who I had as dream sort of ideal people who would make the book work in, in the way it did. I think I, I, I kind of had a sort of basic idea of what I needed to make it at all uh, in that I couldn't have done it without anybody, but I, but the sort of caliber of person as well. And I really hit the top end of that caliber. If you think of like the, I wanted, the aim was to have um, his family involved, the, the boardroom involved if possible, the coaching staff, players, everyone around him and around the club at the time to give every different possible angle. And I think that's what I got. Um, in terms of contacting the different people, it's you know a case of asking around if people know know how to contact these people and and hoping they hoping they respond and taking the knockbacks when they happen. You know, sometimes you can contact somebody and they don't get back to you. You can contact somebody and they can't do it for whatever reason or the you know whatever. And that's that 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 sort of part of it, but it's a case of just sort of seeing where you, how far you can get. And I had a, a rough idea. I didn't set anything out, as I say, but I had a rough idea of where I wanted to go with, um, you know, the level of the level. And I knew kind of that the book would live and die with who I spoke to, because I was kind of given the floor to whoever I was, you know, to, to the people I wasn't, it's, there's very little of me, if you like in the book, there's nothing of my, my opinion. It's all about everybody else's, sort of thoughts so that yeah. made it so important that you needed to get the key people and in terms of you know so john hall's in there um charlie woods a chief scout and bobby's closest friends in there mark robson his son's in there john carver's in there that kind of you get that feeling of that detail and that and I, the re what i really wanted people to do is when they read it is, is read it and think oh i didn't know that do you know what i mean and uh, because I think everyone knows the stories knows the outline but they might not. It might change their perception of what they think or what they know, and that's kind of what what ended up happening with me when people were. Talk, I, I would know what I wanted to ask people about certain games, and then someone would say something about a game, or 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 even just the build up to a game, and it would just change my perception of that of that game and and that little bit better, and give me you know give me that little bit more insight, and that's kind of where I was hoping to go with it. But in terms of like how to go about it, it's just literally about finding uh, the best contact details and chasing them up and seeing and and, hap and gladly because I think it was Bobby and because I think it was such a, a happy subject there was it was there was no threat to it there's no uh, I'm not trying to ca cast them out and get a story for a headline for a, for an article yeah. that's gonna go yeah. and across the across the news or whatever they were happy to open up to me and it, and, and it makes the book something that I'm really proud of and something that I think is really gonna I hope I mean I know you guys have, have read a little bit of it, and I, I hope that it, it does sort of make people think about it and people enjoy reading it as much as I as much as I as enjoyed writing it because that's kind of why I wrote it is because there was a space to write a book about it. So uh, I, really, I think yeah, as well what, what you say there as well it's it's kind of untapped, isn't it? No one sort of delved into that side. So when yes. you when you as you as you rightly said there when you approach people. Um, I mean, for example, Hugo Viana. I mean, you know, what, like what personally, when I remember when we signed him, how you know how amazing I, I thought he could be. Yeah. Um, probably these people haven't been approached in detail like that about Robson before. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So obviously, them are probably really welcome to to want to talk about, him, which is which is obviously great for for yourself. 
Yeah, I mean, with Hugo particularly, he he was somebody who couldn't couldn't stop talking about how great Robson was. <laughs> um, he would he would in terms of the father figure thing, and which he keeps t- he kept talking about, and he kept talking about how easy he made it. There's a funny little story in there about how he they've tried to communicate. He would what, what he would communicate in bad English. Bobby would communicate in bad Portuguese. They like. <laughs> Get there in the middle, and then Nobby Solano will just finish off with a little bit of like Spanish translation in the middle, and it kind of works, um, kind of works really, really well. And I think that that's the sort of thing. I mean, the the way that Hugo particularly spoke about it, about Bobby and about the club, it kind of made me feel like he th- he feels about Newcastle the way a lot of Newcastle fans think about him. In that, I think everyone remembers him and goes, "Oh, what a good player! Pity it didn't work out." And that's kind of how he feels about the club. If you, I, I think he he is he was so honest and so open. He didn't get defensive about the fact that his his career didn't work out generally because he, he I mean he was supposed to be in the same bracket as Cristiano Ronaldo. And people genuinely forget that and he should have played in the Champions League and won Champions Leagues based on his potential as a kid. And he never really he did some very good things even at Newcastle. I mean he still scores key goals, but um, but he didn't fulfil his potential. And he kind of was philosophy. Uh, philosophical about that and I think with Bobby when it and Bobby was the reason he came and Bobby was the reason that he sort of was able to settle the way he was he just wasn't quick enough I think is the problem with with that I, I felt yeah. with Viana he, just, he wasn't quick enough for centre midfield and he wasn't quick enough for left midfield uh or he wasn't physical enough for centre midfield or quick enough for left midfield I should say yeah and I think that's how you you know with him but but generally yeah most people were just so happy to um to open up and speak about him he he was a great hope of mine, Hugo Viana. I um I remember being really excited when he signed. He, he just won, as you say, a, a European Player of the Year, Young Player yeah, of the Year award. It was a yeah. weird thing. I think it was only voted for by Italian journalists. It was a really strange kind yeah. of thing. It's, to not it. young, it's not like the it's not the uh, whatever it's called the the golden Bo- the golden boy, which Mbappe and Haaland and those guys have won. It's not that. I don't know. I can't actually find any like modern equivalent of it. So, but he did. He, it was the Young European Players of the Year. It was really weird, sort of. Like, I don't know what's happened to the to the award, but he was so highly rated. And he talks about Liverpool wanting him. I think Juventus were, were around there as well. And there's literally a point where he he, he thinks he might go to to Liverpool. Abel Javier, who's a Portuguese international teammate of his, was, was on his on his case to come to Liverpool. And then Bobby rings him, and ten minutes later, he's decided to sign for Newcastle. And that sort of is is it's, it's all down to Bobby. Yeah, he was a player. As I say, I, I, I kind of followed him. I remember at the time thinking he's he's definitely had something about him, but he was a little bit slow, maybe a little bit light. He, he, my memory of him was that he, he wanted to have a lot of time with the ball, which obviously in yeah, well, not not that he played centre midfield an awful lot, but in centre midfield in the, in, in England, you, you don't tend to get. But uh, he went on. I mean, he, even his career subsequently, Castle. I think he was in Valencia for a while, and he he went to Braga um, and had a good mm-hmm. few years. There. He was in Europe most years. Yeah. Um, well, European competition obviously in Portugal he's in Europe every year, but he was in the uh, UEFA Cup as it was, and he, he I think he's, he he played for Portugal quite a few times as well. He still had a, a decent enough career. Hugo Vaillant, it's, it, it's something that um, we've mentioned on the podcast. That I always I don't always, but often compare him to uh, Mikel Marino in that it was yeah, maybe you know, Mikel Marino is definitely, and it's it's a very good comparison actually. But I think I think Solano said we, I talked to Nobby about him because Nobby was I spoke to Nobby after I spoke to Hugo, so. I knew that Hugo had said that Nobby was his closest friend, so I thought, well, I'll ask, I'll ask Nobby what he thought. And what basically he was, he was really honest about it, and he said, yeah, he just wasn't. He was technically good, and Bobby waxed lyrical about him in his book, which I've quoted as well. Um, he just wasn't. Um, he was, as I say, he wasn't strong enough for midfield. He wasn't. He couldn't get up and down the pitch enough. And the way Newcastle played with that four four two, and it's all about energy in the midfield as well. Yeah. You had speed and genius and. Um, and Dyer as well. And the only thing that I think is a pity about Viana, the biggest thing or I should say, is that he talks about Gary Speed. Him suppo- he supposedly came in to replace Gary Speed. Gary Speed is 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 much plays on much he's much fitter and much stronger and much better for longer than anyone thinks he is. He should be. But Speed leaves in the same summer as Viana. And I said, yeah. Is that not a shame for you that 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 you left? And he said, But by then I'd already decided to go. And it was a that's a a really sort of like what if moment, and that's kind of that that that's the thing, the saddest thing I think is that 
and even if he played at Newcastle now or played in the Premier League now, he'd probably thrive because the game's changed and mm, yeah. four four two isn't what isn't what it isn't what it was back then. And and if he was, he just he he feels like he'd be the ideal on the left side of the three in midfield. It would just be brilliant. But obviously that that was never a formation that Bobby was ever going to play, and he just never quite fit in. But Bobby, as I say, he said he was the most technically gifted player he had at the club, so there was obviously something there. Yeah, definitely. And he's um I remember when, when Gary Speed died, um mm. Hugo, it was a picture of Hugo full time in a game and he had the it was in Portuguese, I think, but the T shirt kind of commemorating or yeah um rest in peace Gary or something like that. And so there's obviously a great strength of feeling there. And that, some things about that that makes it oh they don't leave Newcastle, then forget about what's happened. You know, there's obviously something yeah. stayed with them. And I yeah. mean in that case it may have been Gary more than Newcastle, but it, it in the circumstances I always think there's something quite uh, quite nice about that, quite pleasant. That maybe that mm-hmm. friendship or the kind of the, the happiness that you may have felt at times that the club's kind of endured over the years a little bit. Um, yeah. Something I hadn't realised, Harry, until I read the book, was a lot, and you mentioned earlier, um, and I definitely fall in this category, where my perception, and I was in my 20s at the time, early 20s, yeah. granted, but my perception up until I read the book was on off a few things completely wrong. Um, I, I had it in my head that it was the kind of... Um, Bobby was a bit too old and it was kind of the younger lads like Sadia Bellamy, um, who, as much as there were kind of um, interesting characters, I dare say, um, I kind of thought, oh, well, he's lost the dressing room. He had that kind of cliche yeah. put out all the time. But reading the interviews in the book wasn't necessarily the case, was it? No, and I think that was, I think the thing, the key thing there, I think is, I think it's Gordon Milne, who was the director of football at the time that Bobby brought in, which is, which in itself is quite funny that Bobby, the director of football manager relationship was completely like it was nothing that it would yeah. be today. And it's even touched upon where he says, "If it's today, then 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 that's probably it's not what it was back then." I basically just came in as a friend and a supporter to Sir Bobby, and that we decided on the name of director of football. That's what we decided. <laughs> but um, which is quite funny. But what he says about Bellamy, and he goes into detail on, on Bellamy specifically. But what he says about the the squad's dynamic at that point is. That sort of thing, those those stories that were leaking and those things that, that were happening were happening every day in training. Bellamy was what he was doing, and Dyer was as troublesome as he was in his own way. But but th- th- these guys were allowed to do what they were doing by Bobby. Bobby let them do it, and he was used to managing people. I mean, Ronaldo. I mean, we know what Ronaldo became like went with, with his party in his career. Gaza. I mean, yeah, of course, Gaza loved the party. And yet he he got the best out of him. And it was the same with Bellamy and Dyer and, and those lads. He he managed them brilliantly for five years. It just so it's it's a bit of a myth because by the time the results are starting to slip and things are slightly other other factors were were it may be a factor in a sense because they were difficult, as you mentioned, they were difficult characters, but when the results go, then those things become a problem, you know. It, it, like even in re- even in even today, you think that if Newcastle are winning or on a five-game winning streak, is that Matt Ritchie story today as big a crisis as it feels like now? It it isn't um, because, but but because of the context of around it, it becomes worse. And the club, the thing that re- that pushed it home was that the club took it as an opportunity. I feel, and a lot of people mm. in the book feel, they took it as an opportunity to say. Actually, yeah, he's lost the dressing room. That's why we're going to move on. But but Freddie had Freddie Shepherd had decided to move on before that. Really, the the dire the dire against Middlesbrough is a is a good story, but it's not really anything major. The Shearer dropping against Villa is a good story, but the 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 the, the cast it's already been cast. The story's already been written by then, and and I feel you get the feeling in the. That's my favourite chapter since the summer, and it, before that, because you really, because you really get the sense of just how things generally were moving in, against him. Anyway, the way that Gary Speed goes, the way that Clivert comes in, the way that, that Newcastle spend the summer chasing after Wayne Rooney, all of these things aren't Bobby centric, whereas everything else was. And I think if you think about that, then the idea that these people, that, that these young lads were running riot. Is it doesn't really stand up as well because if you because the, the, there were there was there was trouble brewing from above him anyway so 
and then and, and then it feels like that, that they've just sort of jumped on that as an opportunity to, to hide behind it and and you know it, it, like, I think actually before the 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 discipline things Shepherds talks about getting value for money out of signings and then the year yeah. later goes and spends 16 million on Michael Owen and yeah. that year spends you know 100 best part of 100 grand on Cliver who's 28 and passed it and you know <laughs> and just didn't take it seriously at Newcastle and all that you know and 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 all that is is, is <laughs> when you think about that, and then you think about the, uh, that they say, oh yeah, but of course, yeah, it's Kieran Dyer's fault. No, it's not. It's a whole myriad of different things. Bobby was, I think I even said it. Bobby was seventy-one. There is a there is a point where you have to make a contingency plan. And yeah. I actually think that putting on a year, changing his rolling contract, which it was, it was a one-year rolling contract, changing that to a, a one-year contract, and then making a uh, an effort to phase him out, make it a phase retirement or something like that, or, or make a big thing, or, and, and actually make the right appointment afterwards. But the, the silly thing with the discipline issue is that's what really, it's not what really, it, that's not what fueled the sacking of Bobby. It's what fueled the, the hiring of the appointment of Suna, yeah. which is the real problem with where with where everything started to go wrong. Because you see that Suna comes in and he's supposed to change everything and make everything, you know, make fix the discipline issues and he basically tells a load of a load of young arrogant footballers who have enjoyed themselves but also performed on the pitch for Sir Bobby that they now can't enjoy themselves as much and then it only and then oh shock horror it makes it worse so <laughs> yeah. it's it's yeah it's, so actually the the whole thing of the I I know what you mean about it because it is that's what people say oh it's easy oh they sacked him oh he missed you know the the, the, the discipline issues and all this it's easy to say oh what but actually, I was pleasantly surprised. And that's why I think that's my favourite chapter is because you really realise, I got to realise interviewing everyone is actually how once you scratch the surface, the picture is completely different to what it's reported as. Yeah, I just want to... Um, sorry, apologise, Bestie. <laughs> sorry, this is going to happen a lot, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it does, it always does. Um, I know obviously we've went forward there, uh, which is great, of course. I mean, you know, it's times that we all want to talk about and, and all that. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to kind of talk about the very beginning of the book. Um, yeah. Obviously, you got George Cortland to do the the forward of the book, um, yeah. which I have to say was was written just beautifully. Um, I haven't yeah. got a better word than beautifully, really. Um, it was it was fantastically written. Um, <clears throat> there's a there's a quote in there, and the, pardon me if I get it wrong, but it was something. Um, that Bobby Robson has played on the same pitch with Jackie Milburn and yeah. then man managed Alan Shearer, who obviously, of course, is the person that broke the goal scoring record. And the, the 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 point at the top says it's hard to grasp, and it really, really is, isn't it? I mean, even when I read it, I, I actually sort of put it down and kind of like looked into space to think, God, like that is unbelievable that you know he's played on that pitch with that individual and then managed Alan Shearer. Um, yeah. just how pleased were you to, 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 to get George to do the forward? Well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, George is this. That the, what you just said about about you know looking at the space and think, oh, every, yeah, that's absolutely. George has this amazing ability to put emotion and also sense on a page like no one, no, no one else. I know like, every piece I read of George's is like you read it and think that's what I mean. That's what it. That's what, <laughs> that's, what it that's what we mean. That's exactly what it is. And that's kind of and I know George fairly well. I've, I've bumped into him at work sometimes, and I. He's he's someone I, I've I've admired for a long time, so I'd gone to see Liz Luff at the foundation before, and he's obviously a patron. So I said that getting George involved was key for me uh, uh, early on. And as soon as he, I mean, as soon as I, he he said he was going, he would do it, and I knew it would be brilliant. So he, I asked him. It was one of the very first things that I asked him. It was one of the very last things that actually happened. So. In the middle of me asking him and, and getting it back from him, the whole book was written, but I didn't have any worries. I said, "Just do it and see." And you know, uh, this is roughly what I want. And then he came back with that, and I was like, "Well, that's <laughs> really, you, know, you you know what I want better than I know what what I want, George. So go ahead and do it." Must be did. George is or George is lush. I mean, he's um, without. I want. I don't want to become the, the George Cock in loving our like, but. Um... But he is. I've I've done. Um, that, to be honest, I think he'd love that. <laughs> he, he would. I, I know for a fact he would. I, I've done. Um, I, I did a Great North Run, but I, I completed the thirty miles. I didn't run it well for the foundation a few years ago, and I, I know kind of Liz through that mainly, and I've, I've known George for a few years now. And yeah. he is. He's just kind of like he. He's a joy to be around. He's a really is an emotional man as well. Like he. Yeah. He, he wrote a bit about the Great North Run. 
Um, a few mm. years ago, that was really kind of yeah. wound up in emotion, and he's he's the perfect choice for the forward as far as I'm uh, concerned. It, it couldn't because George wrote Bobby's last book as well. Yeah, um, no, exactly. exactly. And and I just I knew it was the one of the first things I knew that I wanted when they talk about the plan about people you know going in interview. You know, as we said earlier, one of the when when the things that I had were, and by the time I should put it in context actually, by the time I pitched the idea to the publisher, I'd already interviewed. Um, Shay Given and John Carver, so it's a pretty strong pitch I was going because I'd already done that. But also, I don't, I, I, I knew that I wanted the one of the first things I knew that I wanted was George to write the forward because I just knew that nobody else could write it better than him. So, and also, but generally, I mean. Having him on the front cover, it may, it, it it's a it feels like a surefire like mark of quality. People go, George has written the forward. It must it might be a good book. <laughs> and so, and, yeah. and, and I can say so. I've told him this, and, and my dad will laugh when I say this. This is Jenny. This is my this is the mind of my dad. Right, I'll tell you this. Um, I said, to, oh, I've got George to do the forward, and he said, you should make his name the big one at the top and put yours in the top. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you can ask this for. But, um, but, but you sort of, even my dad understands, you know, so. Just endorsed yeah, it, by it really is, it, massive. It's just an, an amazing forward. Like, it really was. And, and like, listen, the, the whole book's fantastic. It really is. And, um, but I, honestly, I swear, I, I, w I was sitting down with a drink and I, I was reading it. And when I, I got to the forward, it's just, you're right in what you say about the emotional attachment that, like, the words yeah. have on the page. It's just, it's quite incredible, really. I, yeah. Honestly, I was sitting there and I was reading it and I was just like, this I was getting goosebumps thinking what the rest of the book's going to be like because of how good the forward was. Exactly. It's really, really good. That that's that's what I mean. The the also the key thing that I think he says that is so difficult because I wasn't going to mention it in the book and nobody else will mention it either. Is that it's easy to sanctify Bobby's memory? <laughs> like it's yeah. easy to say how brilliant as a man of Bobby, a man of Bobby as Bobby was and how fantastic he was. But he was also a hard nosed man. He was also very he mentioned about sharp elbows. He mentions and. Mark goes yeah. in, you know, talks about quite candidly about not seeing very much of his dad growing up and and things like that. I think it's mentioned that Paul and Andrew's oldest his eldest sons had to go into boarding school after Fulham um before Ipswich because they weren't sure how long he'd last at Ipswich because he'd been sat mm -hmm. by Fulham. Um and you sort of and you think about the sacrifices that Lady Elty and the three lads made and but also Generally, I mean, he he wasn't just he, he's remembered as a kind, gentle old man, but he wasn't that really. He was a he was a master at man management. He was funny, but he was also he knew how to put people in their place. And yeah, he, no. and that's an important point that I certainly I kind of I'll admit I kind of got a little bit carried away. And I think George says it actually. I don't know if he says it in the forward or he's just said it to me or, or written it in different pieces. Basically, it's difficult to be objective about Bobby, especially when you know him as well as George. Obviously, I didn't, so I don't quite have the... But even for me, it's it's still hard to be objective about Bobby because he because you remember him as this, what he did for the club, but also this guy, this this amazing person. And that's the key thing that, that, or that George mentions, I think, that I take away from it, is that he says, let's not forget that he fought players at Ipswich. He didn't see his, his kids very much. Mark talks about not not ever speaking to his dad about football. And you think, and everyone must go up to him and say, what it must it have been like being Bobby Robson's son talking about football? Yeah. And he said, I never did it. And that's kind of, you've got to remember this, that side, that there is that side to Bobby as well. Do you know, Harry, you, you've said there just before about moments in the book where you're hoping people will be like, wow, I didn't know that. Mm. I, I can't express to you how shocked I was at them moments that you've just mentioned there, that, there's a part where I believe Mark says something like, I've never been in the, the corridors or the changing rooms. or, yeah. mm -hmm. and, I, and honestly, I, I could not believe that um, because I felt that, you know, having dinner with Bobby Robson every night, if that was me dad, I'd be like, right, Bobby, who was signing? What's happening? Yeah. What's the formation of the weekend? Never, um, and when never. I was reading that, was was quite incredible. Um, yeah. It really, really was. No, I, I think that's, that's, that's something that I sort of take away from it and, and just how difficult it must have been um, and then you get the sort of the, the added bits of what of, from Charlie Woods, who was the chief scout as well. So you talk about, so I'd start the conversations. 
with Charlie. And, I, and, and Charlie Rudd is the one person I've actually taken, like I've, I speak to him quite often. I spoke to him this morning. Um, I, I actually started speaking to him a lot more. But he was somebody I originally I wanted to speak to about Lauren the Bear, and I wanted to speak to him about signing Bellamy and signing Woodgate and all as as I did. But the best bits from Charlie are the, are the bits about Bobby, and yeah. because it contextualizes Bobby the man, and that's why I did the second chapter. The last chapter is about the foundation, so it's less about Bobby as a person, more about that chapter of his life. But that the sort of the bits about the the Ashes tour in the second chapter, where he talks about mm. where he wasn't ill, he not he wasn't well enough to go to to an Ashes tour. Yeah, Those with the with, the, with the, and the even the little bits about you know coming home, Bobby would be always late when he's picking Mark up from 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 school and stuff. That that's the sort of thing I didn't want to make. It's not an autobiography or a biography of Bobby Robson, but that's the sort of little bits that I wanted to get in there just to contextualize what what Bobby was as a as a younger manager, which would feed into what he became at Newcastle. Yeah, definitely. I think that comes across as well. that You, you do get a, a feeling of what he was as a, as a man, as a human being, you know. I mean, you mentioned that. I've actually got um, George's sharp elbows comment kind of highlighted as something to, to mention. There's a point where um, Warren Barton said he's a little bit arrogant as well, and I kind of had to read that two or three. Is, is that what he's said then? Mm. Is he say contextualise it? But yeah, I mean, you look at Bobby, um, he was in football uh, as a manager for uh, like five, six decades. Um, yeah. And a successful one at that, you know, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, he, he won things everywhere. Um, mm. And you don't get to be as successful as that for that length of time without having a bit of that in you. I mean, there's a part where he um, he takes on Craig Bellamy in wonderful fashion, talking about the players he's managed. And yeah. just like, who, who are you? I've managed Rivaldo, I've managed yeah. Hadji, I've managed Stoichkov. Who are you? And the, yeah. and that's something that, um, that really stood out was that, and again, going back to my point earlier about maybe in the past feeling that he was a bit, too old and he didn't, didn't understand the younger players he, he had a, a perfect grip on them yeah, yeah he really did I think the key thing for that is and you can see the clip that I, I think I quoted it but you can see it on one of the documentaries I think it's the one where with Gary Lineker when, it, when it's done at Newcastle the BBC one the one where he talks about and I put this in the intro, in the introduction just as a little side tangent before you know when he talks about the but the thing that sums Bobby up better than anything is the when he's in the lift or he's coming out of the lift and he says yeah. stop and he turns around and he goes to the door and he said, "This is oak, not plywood. This, <laughs> this is what makes the pl- this is what makes a big club." And you think yeah. no, that 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 is brilliant. That work that is symbolism in two ways because it works one to say that's what Bobby brought to Newcastle. That's the man- that's the mentality he had, and that's what Newcastle should be. But it's also sim- symbolic in that that's exactly what Newcastle aren't now. Yeah. So Newcastle are making doors out of plywood metaphorically. Now they they're not. They're not making doors out of oak. They're not doing, you know, that he couldn't walk around. Maybe he could because the door is still there, but metaphorically, he couldn't walk around St. James's Park and show off everything about Newcastle now because the club isn't the same club anymore. But that's that's the, why I put that quote in the introduction because it's symbolic in, in so many ways. But the quote, to answer your question, the quote I was going to talk about is when he he's stuck outside the door and he's talking about how everyone thinks he's old, he gets names wrong. And then he rattles off these names of all these players in the Holland and England teams in, in Euro 88. Yeah. And he says, yeah, and yeah. they haven't buried me. See you later. And that's it. And then he walks off and it's like, that's what he means by arrogant. It's not that he thinks he's brilliant, which he probably does, but he doesn't, he doesn't come across. It's not Jose Mourinho arrogant. It's not, you know, Ferguson arrogant. It's like, you know, when he, when he needs it, sit down, son, I'm here now. And that's yeah. what, what makes it so good and while also being so understanding so um so brilliant <clears throat> with with younger people as well and younger players giving people opportunities um have being humble enough to 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 make make himself relatable to them and younger players and make himself relatable to to Shearer and but also likes of Shearer and likes of Ronaldo at previous clubs and all that but also make be able to put them in their place as well and that's again. It's one of those little nuances. Those little nuances. Those things is what makes are what makes Bobby so so amazing. I think. I think you, you mentioned there about the. It is a fabulous because I must have been. I watched that show. That sorry, the the the, the DVD feel like quite often. Just call me Bobby. Mm. I, I I watched that quite quite often actually over a year to, to be really honest. Um, and on that bit, it's there's a, there's always been a joke, hasn't there, about Robson in regards to getting players' names wrong, and you know, yeah. and the, I think Warren Barton and and 
um, I think it's Warren Barton mentions about the core court situation with Shola, and it's fabulous. I was laughing my head off. I really was when I was reading it. Um, mm. I think what what also is very good within the book is that a lot of people, when you're interviewing them, you can see that it's like they still don't really know if it's a game Robson's playing even now. Yeah. Like the same, you know, yeah. And even I think now, that's tremendous. That that is it's brilliant. Um, the Shea Given, the Shea Brennan, Shea Given one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's the one he says. He says, "I'm not even sure now if he was saying if he was if he, if he meant." Yeah. And, and on the outside, we go. Of course, he meant it. But when you're inside all the time, and you see him all the time. Yeah. It, it must be, must be difficult because he. But he was. That's what he was. He was a genius. He was a. He was. He was. He was so clever, and so brilliant. And there's the, the funniest, player manager story. I think the book's going to be serialized in the Chronicle next week. I think this is one of the stories, but I may as well say it anyway. Um, Rob Lee goes in, he's really annoyed about wanting to leave Newcastle because he's not playing and, and his contract. I think it's more that actually his contract's running down and he isn't getting a new contract. He goes to see Bobby, and Bobby says, Oh, you need to go and speak to Freddie Shepherd because Freddie does the contract. Freddie goes to Freddie and says, Freddie, do you do the contract? So then he says, he says, No, Bobby does the contracts, he's always done the contracts, he's the manager. Of course, Rob knows that because Bobby's always done the contracts before. He goes back into Bobby's office and says, Bobby, I need a new contract. He said, Freddie said, you do the contract. He said, I son, I do the contracts. But I can't give you a new one because your legs have gone. He said, all right, then fine, let me leave. He says, I can't let you leave, son. You're my best player. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, it's like, and then and then Rob Lee's kind of like, he doesn't know what to say, so he just walks out and laughs. And, and that kind of the beauty of him is that he could go in, say something utterly ridiculous or a, a brilliant put down or whatever, and it just took the fire out of the situation. And yeah. you see it with Paul Robinson talks about it. Steve Caldwell talks about it as well. There's so many examples of that thing. I think there's another one with Jermaine Genius, which isn't in the book, where he goes in and he convinces Jermaine Genius that Jermaine Genius is annoyed that he isn't above Dyer in the team or something. He walks in and comes out, you know, having agreed with Bobby that he shouldn't be in the team. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a gift, amazing. isn't it? That's a gift. And not, not realizing how he's how he's got there, and that's kind of the, the the thing that's so constant. And you don't get that by just being a friendly old man. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's what you. Yeah, that's how I would sort of say it. Yeah, there's a, a similar one in there with with Craig. Bell. I don't want to give too much away and kind of spoil the book, you know. It, it, uh, but the similar thing with Craig Bellamy in the airport um, on the way mm. to Mallorca, where he kind of just he gets him on, literally gets him on board. Um, yeah. which is uh, which <laughs> I quite right. enjoy, but again, I, I don't want to give too much away there, like because obviously, um, they do want people to buy the book. Um, mm. uh, going back to the, 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 what you were saying about the um, the just call me Bobby documentary when he's in the lift with Gary Lineker and he's showing off the club, and yeah. it, that's kind of the ambition at the club at the time they got him. You know, the, the stadium had just been expanded, the squad was being improved. Um, it, it felt it, and reading back, it really does seem as if he came in at the perfect time for the club, yeah. I mean. He was needed at that time because the club was on the was on the brink of oblivion. I don't think I think that's something different to Keegan. There's a parallel between Keegan and Robson, and granted, I don't as I said, I don't remember, but the physically remember the the, the Keegan era. But when Keegan comes in, Newcastle are on the brink of relegation to the third tier. They're just going nowhere. There's nothing about the club to be excited about. Whereas when Bobby comes in. They're going down, and it's the same sort of disaster. But it's more of a disaster because of what's gone on in the Keegan years. Bobby comes in, heals it all. It's all you know, great. Literally, almost, almost straight away. Um, but also, I mean, imagine what he, if he'd come in. I mentioned it. Imagine if he'd come in after they tried to get him after Keegan. Yeah. That, would, oh. that would have been amazing. And we've never actually seen that in the modern Newcastle era. In that you've got two managers back to back who sort of progress the club properly. So you've got where well, you've got a, a Keegan after a, Bob, a Robson after Keegan, or a I don't know someone, a, a young manager, a, a Brendan Rodgers after Rafa, something like that. Do you know what I mean? Someone who could take the club in a different direction and still make them go up. That's never happened, and it would have been perfect. But he came in when Newcastle badly needed him. And if you talk, and the thing that I took away from the ambition thing is, they mentioned the training ground, which of course now is a staple for if you want to mesh if you want to talk about how Newcastle aren't ambitious in the modern day, you mentioned the training ground, you mentioned the paddling pools and stuff and all that stuff. You, know, you mentioned the the poor training pitch or well you mentioned how basic it is compared to like Leicester or 
or whatever, who built, you know, been building these states of state of the arts things. But that's that was state of the art back in two. So that was one of the things that they brought in to go. We are one of the biggest clubs in Europe, which shows how just how much Newcastle has stagnated since. But it, it there was so much ambition. I think that's the Freddie Shepherd was not a better, no better chairman than Mike Ashley. He was just bad in a different way. But at least he tried. At least he wanted to push the club forward. I think that is why. And there's a lot of rewriting history. Um, around that boat, around that era, around Bo- Shepherd and Hall generally, but around Bobby Robson and the, the way he left, um, particularly. But I think with Shepherd, the thing that will always give him the edge over Ashley, apart from recency unbias, is the fact that he always did try, even if he was putting the club into serious damage, as it turned out with you know nearly going into debt and all that but at least he actually wanted to see Newcastle progress which is something that that that, that is the fundamental thing that you need to be a, to be a success at Newcastle is a willingness to push the club on and that's what Bobby was able to but Bobby brought it back but he also did it he also put new pushed Newcastle forward without spending anywhere near the amount of money that that Keegan did I mean he didn't he didn't sign a player for more than 10 million and yet Newcastle were challenging at the top of the league I'm uh, sorry. I'm 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 going to be jumping around a little bit. I know, but uh, no. I, I'm just really interested to in know these things. Um, so, obviously, you've touched on there before that you, you spoke with with his son and obviously um, the, the family. Um, how how was sort of their take in, in that approach? Um, and obviously, perhaps them them have maybe read certain bits of the book. Like, were them thrilled that you were doing a book, for example, or? Um, I think they were they were supportive. I mean, I only spoke to Mark. I, I was keen to know what Lady Elsie thought, and I will, when COVID allows, eventually go and sit with her and talk her through talk through the book with her if she, if she has any questions and that sort of thing. I do want to go and meet her, but I only spoke to Mark, and Mark was very gracious originally. He was he. I was expecting a little bit more friction, probably because, as I said earlier on, it, it's it's a it's a difficult subject if someone you don't know comes along and says, we want to write a book about your dad. Yeah. It must be a weird sort of thing that I, I know I'd get quite, if I was in his shoes, I'd probably get quite um, protective, protective of that. Um, but he was, uh, he, he read, he's got the book now. He's reading it now. Um, he's one of the two people along with George who I gave a, an advanced copy to. Um, and he, but he also read chapter, the two chapters around, um, Bobby as a person second in the and the the foundation chapter to just okay it and just say you know there was yeah. there was no factual errors or anything that's that sort of thing and he was fine with it so I didn't have any problems with the family at all they were um they were happy enough to support it and they and they and they've been just as supportive as they were from day one even now and I think that that was something that was really important to me I don't know what I would have done if they didn't if they didn't support it, but there was yeah. no reason for them not to support it. But I think the fact that they have been so gracious and been so they haven't even you know he hasn't demanded to see anything. He they, nobody was making any sort of you know it was it it it, it, it was down to me to, to to put the olive branch out almost and say this is what I'm going to do. I'd like as much help from you as possible, and he gave me everything that I needed from him. Yeah, it's, um, I think that's an important thing. I mean, you do see um, books come out. I think the Damned United, where the kind of wrote the the, the Clough family were, were most obsessed yeah. with the portrayal yeah. of. Uh, I know it's a, an actual work of fiction, but they were still weren't consult, consulted on it. No, and, um, I, that what, was what, what, in my mind actually. The, yeah. that I literally thought I remember reading something. I think an interview or watching an interview with Barbara Clough about the Damned United. I think it was the book rather than the film. Yeah, and I remember Johnny Giles saying, and Johnny Giles is portrayed as this bastard in the film, and oh, yeah. you obviously know, but but in the but his interviews, he say, he turns around and says what it must have been like for the Clough family to re- watch and read that, and I thought, yeah, that's that's kind of it, it did resonate with me. It was like I've got to I've got to reach out and say this is what I'm going to do, but I'll not just tell them I'm going to do it. It would be it was beneficial to get Mark involved for the quotes, but also just I kind of wanted. His him to be okay with it. I, I, it was something that was quite important for me from the start. So would you say that it's something that's carried you through lockdown, Harry? I mean, obviously, uh, hopefully, yeah. touch would come towards the end of things. I mean, did you have the idea to write the book 
prior lockdown or was it something that kind of lockdown spurred on or no it was i did i had it before lockdown so i i it just happened to coincide completely with i, I finished it just before that december lockdown the third or the second one or whatever it was literally <laughs> the, the closing date to put the book in was the 30th of november but i'd gone to see liz in the copthorne in newcastle which is where the foundation does all of their sort of thing um, and sat with her, and that was the second of March, so literally just about a year ago. Um, mm. And I had no idea. I don't. Rem I remember not think. I remember thinking back when I thought back to that day. I, I don't. I remember specifically not thinking anything about COVID, not thinking yeah. it was like weird that I, we were, I was on a train, not thinking it was weird that we were sat in a in a all of the stuff that we did, that I did that day to, to to go and have that meeting is now probably it's now technically illegal, which is really weird. Um, yeah. But. And that's how weird this whole thing's been, but it kept me going. Honestly, I mean, I was doing the interview, so the the, the main chunk of like that, the first lockdown in the in the spring was mainly interviewing, and doing a little bit of a writing of, of writing it, but mainly the interview. And then the writing came in the summer part, and then by the time I was, I was it was done, um, we were just heading into the into that Christmas one. So it got me through the, the the two main the first the main part of the of the main uh, the first lockdown was was just completely consumed by the book yeah. And I suppose this lockdown or getting towards it now you'll be doing your, your press junket and um, yeah, podcasts and film yeah. and film stuff you know just kind of getting out there and getting it um, promoted. Yeah. So basically, from from the thirtieth, it was kind of a case of. For the next month, it was so it wasn't done then because the next month was they would come back and say uh, there was a couple of things that, that needed clearing up in the you know like factual things that they clearing up and then there was a couple of, like just reading through it. I had to read through the book about four times and then listen and then read through to read through the what would be the the physical copy, then read through what would be the Kindle copy, and I had to read through it and put my own sort of like if I had any problems editing it. You know, my, any problems or any any issues, I could flag them then. So actually, it wasn't done completely until about mid December, and then by that point, and then it was, and then I got the copy, which I've got here actually, the, the very first physical copy. I got that on the on the thirtieth of January. So actually, there's not been a point where there's been a lull really. I don't think, and then suddenly, what is it? A, you know, a month later, and I'm I'm doing as you say, I'm doing all this the. I'm talking about it, which is which is the best bit, really. I just love to. Yeah. That's kind of why I did the book in the first place. Because I love talking about Bobby. I love thinking about that. You know, what, I'm like you, Decker. I, I watch the, those films all the time, and I. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's kind of the whole point was like to to put that all that energy to good use. So that's what I've done. <laughs> and then, yeah, and, oh, no, honestly, I think you, yeah, in a sense, you're living a lot of our our dreams if i'm being honest i really mean that i mean like being able to reach out to these ex-players and, and speak about the the great times that they've had under robson and the mm. champions league years and the european years all the rest of it you know it, it honestly is it's fantastic um it, it, first of all i also want to say i love the front cover by the way i know i Thank you me. know i think it's absolutely tremendous um I, I i love just such a poetic sort of image of Robson you know what I mean I think for me that, that that type of image and also the one with the umbrella of Barcelona for me personally are, are, are very very special moments um in regards to the people that, you, that you've interviewed which is obviously a lot of people um was the was the one that stood out that was sort of I don't know willing to give more information away or or, or, or what or who was your favorite to interview well I mean I mean I, I, as I said I, I love Charlie Woods because you got a much deeper nobody knows Bobby professionally like Charlie does. He worked with him at Ipswich. He was around at England. He was a sort of unofficial scout of the Italian 90. He was around at... I did an interview with him for the set pieces a couple of months ago. And he talks about this conversation that he has when he's at Barcelona. So he was, he, even though he was not working with him, he was still at Ipswich at the time, he was working a lot alongside Bobby in such a... In, in like an unofficial capacity. Then he comes to Newcastle in 99... And then he works him like he's one of the few people who, who you could talk to to get an inside track a little bit on the island gig that he had. The little the people forget that he, he worked with Ireland, yeah, yeah. while while really sort of like the cancer was really taking taking hold. And uh, yeah. Ruth Bummer talks about cancelling uh, chemotherapy sessions because he got a match to go to, which just shows you again sums him up. But um, 
so Charlie was Charlie was brilliant because you got different angles. John John Carver is, I think, the when I talk about taking it from a good book into a sort of like really detailed book, I think John Carver's key for that. Um, and then you've got certain and then certain stories you I was lucky to have certain people for who are you know in in around like the, like I'll give you the the final when I'm talking about the final game and you've got John talking about what it's like on the bench or you've got the Arsenal game and John's talking about running down the stairs being late to hand the team sheet in the Arsenal yeah. game that sort of like thing it, it, it sounds silly but it but when it's in the context of the book it may it adds that sort of yeah. that context to everything I think that's what makes it great personally I was so chuffed to get through to Shea Given because he's such a such a hero and, and Nobby Solano as well there they were the two I would say the big stars from that team that, that I, I was able to get um involved in in terms of like the you know if you look at the one to eleven of what you would say Bobby's best team was at the time I think they were the two that I got that were would guarantee to be in there um and Nobby was really good on how he left as well and he was honest and open that's the one thing I would always criticize I still would now I still think it was the wrong decision to get rid of Solano at the time and he tells the story about how that happened brilliantly um and I do as I, as I say I think you mentioned the front cover. I can't take too much credit for that. I basically the front cover. What happened there was, I said I wanted Shearer on it. I wanted Bellamy on it. I wanted that picture of Bellamy, the one against Feyenoord. I wanted yeah. Shearer doing his celebration, and I wanted Bobby on it. And then they came up with that, and I said I didn't need to see a second one. That's, yeah, that's what yeah, ex- yeah, exactly right. It's absolutely tremendous. It really is. It's that kit as well. I've got a thing, and this yeah. is um, this this is. Something that I've, I've, I noticed years ago, and it's, I think it's just me. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm not an interesting man really, um, <laughs> but I kind of Newcastle eras, especially in the early Adidas years, are kind of the kits are so consistent with that, the form. That, so you've got the, yeah. the Grandad colour, the finished twice, finished yeah. second twice. Yeah. The Barcelona shirt, the finished thirteenth twice. Yeah. The finished eleventh in that one, in that one. Yeah. So the the design of kits here, and I remember um, the last game of the season um, with the war, that one for the first time, they beat Villa three 0 yeah, I was at, um, that was my yeah. second game as a, at Newcastle. I was the I went to two games that season. I went to Middlesbrough and they lost two one. I went to that yeah. one. I remember that kit, and I and yeah, and you you kind of it's what in a weird way. I don't know about you, but I kind of tag that game onto the following seasons because yeah, of that totally. kit. It, that... It's, it, and it's and 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 then I, like I was because I was watching it the highlights back of that game because I watched the DVDs again, and I watched the highlights back and I thought. Why is Solano wearing number fifteen in that kit? Yeah. Uh, oh, it's before he got he changed to number four in the summer. Yeah, and I am exactly the same. Like to the point of where I can't enjoy the first Northern Rock kit, which is a beautiful shirt because it reminds me of Bobby leaving and then Sooners ruining the team. That's yeah. how, and, and even the following two seasons where we're sort of like there's the obviously everyone's talking about the resurgence on the road, but the, that even that kit's a lovely kit, the golden trim, yeah. but. But you can't. It doesn't. You don't have the same. It might even. It might even be a nicer shirt than the than the, the Champions League one to to look at. But it just doesn't resonate with me the same way. The the brown ale, the last brown ale, the blue trim one. That's the first memory I have of, of Newcastle. Is my dad scaring the life out of me just celebrating a goal in that shirt? I don't remember the goal. I don't remember anything about it. I just remember feeling like scared shitless by my dad screaming in that shirt. That's what I remember. <laughs> what, what, one of my memories, is, I know we're going off a bit, but th- this year, it's really hard, you know, when you're like this. Um, I do it all the time. I always get it wrong. Honestly, I, I, I swear to you, I remember I was at my mates. I was playing championship manager. We were playing champ man. And mm. we were playing uh, Southampton away. Obviously, Hullet was in charge at that that time. Yeah. Um, which is covered in the book, of course, in, the, in yeah. almost the first chapter. Um. And I remember I went home. I went just save the game. I'm going home. And I was only yeah. a kid then, but it, you know yeah. it meant as much as it does now. And I, think, I still, I must admit, it's one of my favourite shirts that ever. It really is. No, I, I, I remember seeing something on Twitter when they wore that shirt with black socks. And I yeah. thought, what a shame! <laughs> what a shame! <laughs> I think it was the semi final against Chelsea. They did the yeah. black socks. Yeah, the yeah. yeah. Well, that's how that's how happened. Game Decker. I think Mark Hughes scored. I'm, I had John Carroll's own goal. If memory serves, that's at the right. yeah, I, right. I was I was in the West Park with my dad. Um, yeah, but I remember that, that one. That was a key game in that in that first part of the season because it's like because we never won at the Dell either. So yeah, and then we obviously never won at St Mary's either. We only won once at St Mary's before we did it. Was it last season or the season before? And it's um, it's it's such a the Southampton is such a that that kit new that Newcastle kit, but also that, that that's that's a game that that 
besides the South, the, the, besides the Sunderland game, that's the one game that I sort of think of when I think of Hullet's implosion in the first half of that season. Is that South game? Yeah, I think maybe because it was live on Sky. I think mm. it was yeah. obviously. I know at the moment we've. Well, I know it's locked down. We've got the luxury of every game being on TV. Yeah. Um, kind of back then, it wasn't necessarily the case, and we were on Super Sunday, if you like. And um, it it just felt larger when it was on the TV back then, you know. And I remember, yeah. I remember yeah. the game so well. I really do. And uh, and as I say, I even interrupted a game of Champ Man for it. So there you go. So. <laughs> if you know Declan, that, that's big business. That that's yeah, that's, big business. Manager, that's, that's, that's a huge <laughs> thing. That. But that what this one? Hang on, where am I going? That one, the last game, the Villa game. It was, yeah. a, you know, it was Kevin Garrick that scored one of the goals. I think Janola got substituted before half time, and it was Gary Speed got sent off for punching Ian Taylor. I think someone he got <laughs> Gary Speed got sent off. I remember that. Oh, I can't remember that. He I was did. there as well. Like. Yeah, he got. I remember because I I remember that because because it was my first win as Newcastle as a, going to the games. I remember that. That's I remember the <laughs> the, 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 the things I remember about that game are Kevin Gallagher scoring. Speed getting sent off and Solano wearing number 15. That's the three things I remember. <laughs> couldn't remember. Couldn't tell you who scored the other two goals. <laughs> no, you know, it is not going to. And I was, I'll have been 20, 21 at the time. So I can't remember who scored the other two goals at all. But yeah, that, that's like the, that's the Robson shirt. From When I was picking out the yeah. shirts to bring out the day, I thought, well, you've got to have, even though that I kind of associate that one more through Hullet. Yeah. To be honest, I totally forget about that one. But that one for yeah. me is the, the Bobby Robson shirt. I must be honest, that's when I was approaching the that the third chapter of the book, which is that season, the the and the first NTL season there, which is effectively, yeah, the I'm pointing to them here, but because I can see them on screen. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to you. But um when you um you know when I was approaching that, I knew that would be the third chapter. And I, I couldn't think of any major things, any games I couldn't think that stuck out other than the like the Sunderland game where Shearer misses the penalty. And then, so if you look at that chapter, obviously knowing my thought process, I look at it and I don't like it because I look at it and think there's too much Sunderland in because the, the two games I talk about, Sunderland at home and Sunderland away, and sort of like yeah. skip between the middle of it, the rest of it. Yeah. And then, but it's sort of saved by Sir John Hall talking about the, the and Warren Barton talking about the growth of the stadium, which is another thing that I was quite happy with. But, the, but I, yeah, I struggled because I couldn't, I don't remember that. I, I remember that season. It was even though I only, I only went to a couple of games, I was only six or seven. I remember that season more, and when I watched back, it you sort of see it more as a that all the players were injured. You had Shearer was injured, Colt was injured, and Dyer was injured. And that's why yeah. you couldn't do anything more than finishing mid table. But even then, like the context of it, um, to take Newcastle from where they were when he picks them up, and I think I said it in the first chapter when I talked about the Roma game four months later, and they're, and they're taking on the future Italian champions and nearly nearly taking them all away. Yeah. But to then go the next season and think, because they were top of the league when they played Chelsea at home, which is one of the games, and that's why I couldn't think of any other better game to start talking about Shola than that Chelsea game where he nearly decks Dennis Wise. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Remember that. Yeah. 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 And that's one of my favourite games to talk about because it's perfect, because that, that was one of the moments I talked about Shola with because even though he didn't do much in, in terms of scoring, he got his debut, obviously, but you got a lot of like the, the the things that made the game me joy in the in the little bit the, the little the less intense moments if you like where the, the where you're not talking about a game or you're not talking about a, a big key run you can explore things and I thought I was expl- you know you, you explore what happened with Shawler and you explore what happened with the Shearer Dyer Shearer uh, Bellamy relationship or go into that a little bit as well mm-hmm. when you can explore things and you get that was like really interesting I think. Stephen Colwell was really honest about Shola. He said, no, he didn't succeed in the way we thought he would because of, and I don't know, maybe it was his mentality, I don't know. But he talked really openly about it. And that's kind of where I thought was most interesting in the, in those chapters. It wasn't, it wasn't, that's a different chapter to the others because the others are so jam-packed with key games, key moments and key things that I was able to build around. That chapter kind of wasn't, so I kind of had to, I, I was able to be a little bit more creative, I guess, with it, with, with the direction I want to go in it. Yeah, looking back, I mean, I, I can barely remember that season at all. It feels like a kind of transitionary yeah. season. They had Daniel Cordoni in the first team. He started off pretty well, yeah. and but Pesedas was not about. And it feels as if that's kind of. And this is gonna. I'm gonna sound like such a dickhead for saying this, but it's almost like kind of you've got the the old. And this is gonna sound awful on the the audio version of this because we're pointing at shirts here. No one's got a clue what we're <laughs> from the Rude Hullet shirt 
to the Bobby Robson shirt. There's kind yeah. of a tra transition in the middle. That, where that's the... a really good way of thinking about it. I kind of like that's the way I I viewed that season. And I remember I rang up uh, Warren Barton and said, "What do you know about this season?" Because I really struggled there. I couldn't find because what I mean is what I, it's not. I, I enjoyed the chapter as I say. It's not that. It's just that I couldn't find like there's not tangible moments. So you think about the first chapter. It starts with Sunderland, then you've got the cup final, uh, cup so, sorry, semi final, and then you've kind of got the little bit about Bobby coming in and then, that you can build around, and then there's only a little bit of space to fill. Yeah. In the sort of fourth and fifth chapters, you've got the key games, the Barca games and the Inter games and the Man United and final and, and, and all that. In that chapter, I couldn't think of like a big game, or if there was a good result, I couldn't think of anything to sort of like build around a story other than. Shearer missing the penalty, which is good. It's good sort of sy symmetry with the obviously we're supposed to be a good side by then. Bobby's in; he's been in for a year. We're supposed to be beating some, and, and then the same thing happens. We yeah. lose at home. Shearer misses. The, Shearer is the story again in a different sense, but it's the story again, and it's a it's a defeat. And how has that happened? And I spoke to Kevin Phillips for a piece last week, and we were having a laugh. And I said, I said, thank you for for the goal against that got rid of Hullet because it, it afforded me the chance <laughs> to write this book. He said, you're the first Newcastle fan to ever thank me for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Phillips is another one. I was just reading it, obviously, with um, sadly Glenn Rhoda. I haven't passed away this week, um, mm. this weekend. Um, apparently, he was he told Watford to sign Phillips in the first place. Yeah, no, apparently. I, was reading, apparently. I, I didn't realise that. I totally... Yeah. yeah. No, apparently. Watch everyone switch off now. I've mentioned that. <laughs> no, I've done it now. <laughs> yeah, but... Um, but no, the, 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 I think it was the third and fourth chapters took us hours to read because I must have breached copyright a hundred times because whenever I read about a game, I was stopping it. I was going on YouTube mm. and I was I was looking at the highlights from the games and it, it, it's just, it's joyous. It really is to, to watch some of the old footage again. And the team, I mean, it was a big thing was made and you, you mentioned a few times in the book about the blue chip players, about um, yeah. um, Given, Speed, Shearer, um, yeah. Rob Lee, you've got to put, put Warren Barton. Warren Barton in the book, I hadn't mm. realised how important he was. Oh, he was, read, yeah, and he was massively so. no, I, I, and I actually asked him. You know, the, there's a I mentioned Tony Blair, and the reason I mentioned Tony Blair is because I went back and watched the uh, that season review, and there's a little clip with you know those intermittent clips that they do, and there's yeah. a little clip where, it, where there's a there's a t Tony Blair comes and does a community thing with, and and Warren was always there at the community things on all of the different things, and he said that was my role, like. Like Rob and Alan were particularly sort of like Alan wasn't everyone that spoke to basically said Alan wasn't the was the captain on the pitch. Rob and Gary were the, Gary Speed and Rob and Warren Barton sorry were the captains off it. They would be the ones who do the arm around the shoulder. They'd be the ones who were organising people and and this is what I meant about when I said about um, you know this the, the the myths about the way Bobby left and things. People say that that. He let the that he 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 let the club go out of control once those players left. But he got rid of Warren Barton um, and Rob Lee at a certain time, and then there was a point where nothing else happens, and then Gary leaves, and I think Gary was a key player as well. And those yeah. two were the sort of axis of the. They were the link between Bellamy and uh, Dyer and Bramble and Genus and Shearer, Rob Lee, Shea, Shea Given. That was that. There was a real age gap that could have been a real problem if it wasn't for Gary and um, <coughs> and Warren. I think. Yeah, I think it definitely does that. I think it comes across <coughs> absolutely in terms of Gary Speed. I think. Uh, yeah. Like, ne nearly every, nearly every interview. Everybody, I couldn't, I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. Like there's a and there's there's a whole bit where I talk. I just there's a couple of bits in one of the chapters where I just quote people. I don't even like give any context. I just quote people about what they say about I think it's speed and I do it again with Bellamy as well. I just don't like say anything else because it's just more powerful the way that they were talking about speed and the way that he as a professional but as a kid and it, you and it, it you come across you come across it in different interviews with people when you know Kieran Dyer has said it a lot. Obviously Bellamy worships speed you know yeah. as a as a hero and as a mentor. But I think that those things were were crucial because, um, because it gives context to 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 the to the inner workings of how the team didn't combust earlier because, or didn't combust at all, it was because there was a gap. There was a the the the, the blue chip boys in the brat pack, which is the opposite, which is the <laughs> diabellies, and um, the younger lads. 
they mixed really well because of Warren and, and, and Gary, I think. Yeah. I think, I, I, again, I, I'm very similar to Bessie. I don't want to quote, you know, you don't want to say anything from the book because you don't want to, you know, give too I, much I, away. I've been the worst for that because I'm like... I'm really <laughs> sorry. I, I, I did want to say one thing, and I, I do apologise. Um, was Obviously, I, I remember how much I loved Robert Lee, and, mm. and I'm best he'll be the same as me. I yeah. mean, my goodness. I mean, Rob Lee to me was... I can't even imagine how much money he'd be worth these days. You know, like he was yeah. the ultimate centre midfielder, in my opinion, yeah. in, in them days, you know. Um, and the thing Hullard came in and obviously just banished him. You know, you train with mm. the reserves, don't want to say yeah. I just I still cannot get my head around that one. But I found it incredibly interesting that that Dyer was willing to give the number back. I never knew that. This may be common yeah. knowledge to everybody else. But when I read that and seen that Dyer was saying, you know, you can have the number seven back. Wow, that was that was incredible. The fact that he offered it as soon as Hullet left, and the key thing I think about that about that chapter, the thing that I take away isn't Bobby's impact actually; it's Hullet's exit's impact more. Yeah. Mm. If you talk about John Carver uh, having to apologise to people, Freddie Shepherd apologising to Rob Lee, there's a whole lot of like people yeah. knew what was going on and they couldn't; yeah. they were powerless to stop it. And that's kind of like how the club had to be cleansed because Hullet just didn't care. He didn't care about Newcastle. He cared about himself. He didn't care about Newcastle against Sunderland. He compared it to, I don't know, he said it was a normal game. It's not a derby. I think he says it's something like, it's not a derby. It's a derby of the region. It's not a derby of the city. Which, in my opinion, when I think and when I think about that quote, I think, isn't, in the case of Newcastle-Sunderland, what makes it so hot, like heated is that it's a derby of the region. It's two separate regions going head-to-head, rather yeah. than two, like, if you, because I look at Liverpool and Everton, that was a friendly rivalry because it because everyone for for a long time yeah. because everyone knew each other in the city. Whereas it's like it's it's our city against their city. That's what and that sort of like the fact that he didn't understand that proved to me that that he didn't you know he didn't get the club. You and can only imagine if, if Twitter was around in them days and he said that type really, of quote. Yeah. I mean, you can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, it's a derby that goes back beyond football as well, doesn't it? Obviously, it goes back. Centuries, yeah. the Newcastle and Sunderland thing. You know, it's not just like how I mean. I, I, that would I'm, I'll, I'll nearly come up with a really bad example there. That I'm not going to do because oh god, um, because of how, how ill feeling. But you, Liverpool Everton's a perfect example where it's two, it's families, it's the same within the same family. It's brothers supporting yeah. different teams, and it, it's not the same as I mean. I'm from South Shields. Me and Deck are both from South Shields, so we kind of when I was at school, it was probably 60 40 Newcastle. I they say mm. Deck found the same thing pretty much. But yeah, when you kind of when you look back and you learn about how Newcastle and Sunderland have been for years and years and years and years before football, it's a real there's a real kind of um, two different identities and a real hatred there. You know, going back way back when. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, as I say, that the importance of Warren Barton and Gary Speed, as if you talk about there, was um, a huge thing, and I hadn't really realised. I mean, it, it seemed reading towards the end of the book where. Um, You've got Shearer signing a new contract, and Gary Speed, I think, was 34, 35. And now, yeah. you, and even then, it was unusual to have players at that age to be that influential over a squad. But um, obviously, when Speed left and Clive Heard came in, you, you mentioned how Bellamy's um, upset, not just because Gary Speed's gone and he's a mentor and a kind of compatriot, yeah. but Clive Heard coming in, um, which I think is kind of a, a symptom of what Shepard was starting to do to Bobby and to the club at the time. Mm. Um, he was worried about that as well, and yeah, that, that that kind of that you can see. I know you said it was your favorite chapter, but right, more or less the one, um, but you can really see the club moving in a different direction there, mm. yeah, absolutely. I think that's what I I like it so much because it starts, it's so it, that, start, that chapter starts at the heat of it, it starts at the end of that of that summer almost, it starts just you know. At the deadline day with the Rooney story, but then it con- it goes back and I contextualize it with what happened before and how everything just unraveled. It started to unravel after. You can say what you like. I re- really, I think everyone has a different opinion. For me, it started unraveling probably probably after the Partizan game, but it really yeah. started to really unravel after the Marseille game. Then it, that's the point of no return because then there's the the Wolves game when everyone boos. And leaves and all that 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 gets glossed over. That then there's the summer where Bobby, uh, sorry, Freddie spends the whole summer just saying, "I want to sign Wayne Rooney," when it's yeah. not going to happen because he's going to go to Man United. 
Um, but I want to sign Wayne Rooney. Can we can we can we use the Woodgate money to sign Wayne Rooney? It's like, can we use the money from our best centre half and not replace him and go and yeah. buy a striker that we don't need because we've got Bellamy? So you can understand why Bellamy's annoyed that. And it ups and you've got Clive coming in as well. So you can understand that. And yeah, it's such a it, none of that had Bobby. And then you talk about speed and you talk and the way that that John Carver explains how speed left really put that sort of like that there was a lot of public, whether it's like arguments in front of other team members or in front of the press, there's a lot of public fallout from that summer. And I think that that's what I remember. That's what I think about that summer now in the context of what I found out and what I wrote about. I think that's, that's how it, it, it just was. It was toxic by, by well before the four games. It, <laughs> Hmm. And then, because they always think, why is he sacked after four games? It's just four games, and we never, we were never good in any August under Bob. Yeah. We were never good in any August. So why is he sacking them after four games? And then you realise actually, it was just the tip of the iceberg. And the way that he did it, oh, but he didn't. Yeah. He did. He was the way that Freddie did it was like, okay, I have to do it because. I just decided to, and he couldn't. He couldn't bring himself to actually tell the truth about why. That that was incredibly tough to read. If I, if I'm being honest, I spoke to Bestie to be honest, Harry, before he even came on and said, "I really found that part hard." If I'm honest, yeah. that was awful. Yeah, it's it's difficult because, um, it's it is. It's it's such a. It was a difficult chapter to write in in many ways. I mean, the worst bit yeah. was the the most heart wrenching bit, like difficult to to write. And I had to stop writing it and write it again and write it again and write it again. It was the last chapter when they talk about the match and John mm. uh, Mark's talking about the match and how they got into the yeah. game. And you think, yeah, that's the difficult. That's the most difficult. But the the way that he went out to the press as well. And I went back and watched that interview that he did for the press, which is on more than a manager. And he he basically the press had been stood outside his house for ten hours that day or seven hours, and. Can you imagine that you've just lost your you you've, you've just lost your your dream job and this press back you know, ask, yeah. after seven hours and he goes out and says here's a quote <laughs> you know yeah. and then and then he, he gives them he, he, to get them to leave he doesn't tell them to leave he gives them what they want and that it, again there's just so many little ways of showing you how much of a great great person he was without talking about the Champions League nights yeah. The, the whatever it's the it's the little tiny little things that you saw why how did he do that why did he do that that's just uh, who who else would do that that sort of thing and that's yeah. kind of where i when i think about sir bobby that's when i think about going back to the very first question why did i write it that's why because he was that he's just that, such, such such a kind person yeah i think the quote that it was something along the lines of like you, you've got what you wanted so you, you can go you don't want to be here you all night you've, you've got yeah. wives and kids to go to you know that, it's yeah. kind of and and that, it is, it's seven a, hours worth of they've been outside for seven hours or something like that yeah it's crazy it is but it was it, like as i say harry it's an absolute joy to read it's a great book um as i say it, it probably took me twice as long to read as i should have done just because i kept on watching videos and, well, that's, and, good, that's great. News. you know i was yeah. i was up in the loft today getting this getting the transition to a shirt just because i wanted it, it, it brings back <laughs> all the memories of i really enjoyed it mate um, oh, great so it comes out on um march the 15th so yeah um it was on monday so you might have to give your mums an iou for it because it's a day after mother's day but um <laughs> i was thinking that actually <laughs> <laughs> but it's available from all usual places harry isn't it yes so you can get it from amazon from waterstones um it's a little bit difficult now to say this because I said it on the Crons podcast, so I've said it on various different places, but I'm making a voluntary donation to the to the foundation with the money that I make from it. So that's a voluntary donation. The, the foundation aren't endorsing the book, which is important to say they're not you know, involved in any way um, in that sense. But I've, as a thank you to Mark, as a thank you to Liz and the guys that I wanted to make it, um, to, to make a donation. So, so if you... Come to me and say that you want you want a signed copy. That will help go towards that donation. But you can get it from Amazon and Watson. Yeah, right. brilliant. So to get a signed copy, they just um, get in touch with you on Twitter. Yeah, Harry, is that right? if you DM me on Twitter, I can because then I can go to the the distributors. I've got my first lots already, but I can get another one quite easily, and uh, and that can that can be organised. Excellent, excellent. Well, 
Harry, thanks very much for coming on, mate. I hope you've uh, enjoyed it. And, I really have. And, Thank you very much. It's been great. And um, good luck with the release and with the rest Thank of the you. kind of press junk that you've got, because yeah, you're going to be a busy man over the next, uh, yes, next few to. weeks, I should imagine. Yes. Thank you very much, though. I've really enjoyed it. It's been great to to, to reminisce again. And uh, yeah, I've loved it. So thank you very much for having me on. No problem at all. Thanks very much, Harry. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, see you all later on.